Hey Wisecrack, Jared again, and today we're talking about everyone's favorite anime with an uncomfortable amount of underage crotch fondling, Akira Toriyama's enduring and much beloved Dragon Ball. While Dragon Ball may appear to be little more than a run-of-the-mill adventure show for kids, the series and its spin-offs actually have roots in some pretty hefty philosophical material. Many fans are aware that, in creating the earliest episodes of Dragon Ball, Toriyama drew inspiration from a 500-year-old Chinese classic, Journey to the West. The superficial similarities are easy to spot. Both feature a group of four adventurers in search of powerful magical objects, among them a monkey-like creature with a magic staff, a horny piggish-looking fellow, etc. Often overlooked, however, is the fact that Dragon Ball, much like Journey to the West, can be read as an explicitly Buddhist allegory. Indeed, a show that many of us watched in our underwear on Saturday mornings while wolfing down Cookie Crisp offers a surprising take on fundamental elements of Buddhist doctrine. Welcome to this Wisecrack edition on the philosophy of Dragon Ball. And note to the diehard fans keeping score at home, since a full discussion of the extended Dragon Ball universe would take quite a while, today we'll focus mainly on the episodes of the original anime most heavily influenced by Journey to the West, the 13 episodes comprising the Emperor Pilaf saga. But first, a quick refresher. Dragon Ball follows Goku, a young boy with a monkey tail and superhuman strength, and Bulma, a girl who plans to collect the Dragon Balls in order to wish for a new boyfriend. Along the way, they team up with Oolong, a shapeshifting pig, and Yamcha, a desert-dwelling bandit with a crippling fear of women. They are in a race against time to collect all seven Dragon Balls before the evil Emperor Pilaf can snag them for himself. At the last moment when Pilaf has gathered all the Dragon Balls and is about to wish for world domination, Oolong saves the day by sabotaging his wish. I want to have the world! The world's most comfortable uh, pair uh, of ultra soft! Uh, uh, <laughs> Journey to the West follows Tripitaka, a Buddhist monk and his three disciples, Monkey, Pigsy, and Sandy, on their quest to locate and bring back sacred Buddhist scrolls to the Chinese court. When the pilgrims arrive at the Buddha's paradise, the scrolls they receive turn out to be completely blank. While Journey to the West involves characters searching for a magical object, there's more to it than your basic annoying fetch quest. The novel is often read as a Buddhist allegory, one concerned with spiritual enlightenment. The characters move from a place of ignorance to one of insight as they get closer to their destination. Surprisingly enough, the same applies to Dragon Ball. Both Dragon Ball and Journey to the West have their philosophical grounding in Mahayana Buddhism. To vastly oversimplify, the Mahayana approach to Buddhism is distinguished from the earlier Theravada school by its emphasis on the collective enlightenment of all sentient beings in the universe, rather than that of any one individual. Accordingly, Dragon Ball puts a premium on acts of compassion and on the growth of the group as a whole. When the heroes of Dragon Ball put others first, they advance in their quest. When they act selfishly and refuse to see things from others' point of view, their progress is delayed. In the second episode, Goku and Bulma encounter a beach turtle who explains that he's lost. I wish there was a way we could help you. Yeah. Hey, I know! Would you like me to carry you to the sea, Mr. Turtle? While Goku wants to put their journey on hold in order to help the turtle, Bulma wants to get right back to her quest to find the Dragon Balls. We're on an adventure! We don't have time to transport a beached turtle, okay? However, Goku's act of compassion unexpectedly turns out to be the most direct route to the next Dragon Ball. Enter Master Roshi, hermit and pervert extraordinaire. Roshi is grateful to Goku for returning the turtle to the sea and gives Goku his iconic flying Nimbus Cloud as a reward. He also happens to own a Dragon Ball, which he's willing to give to Bulma in exchange for, well... <laughs> it's a weird show, guys. The ethical implications of trading peep shows for magical jewelry aside, the fact remains that Bulba and Goku find the Dragon Ball because Goku is willing to delay his own gratification in order to help out a fellow being in need. So aren't you glad we decided to help the turtle now? It paid off! I sure am! You were so right! You know, now that I think about it, as the series goes on, Goku spends a lot of time dragging around his useless childhood friends while doing all the work. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Krillin. But I do! If that ain't compassion, I'm not sure what is. This correlation between ethical behavior and speed of progress is lifted straight from Journey to the West, in which a lack of compassion on part of the pilgrims causes delays that can only be resolved through compassion and understanding. Monkey often gets in fights with monsters, only to realize that those monsters were supposed to help him. Both Pigsy and Sandy start out as foes, only to eventually become allies. This goes part of the way toward explaining early Dragon Ball's unexpected attitude toward violence. 
for a franchise that would eventually go on to feature scenes such as this, 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 and this. Dragon Ball in its earliest episodes has a surprising lack of violence. Like Journey to the West, the show is preoccupied with a particular Buddhist conception of non-violence. Violence is not universally wrong so much as it is cumbersome. To some degree, it does get in the way of insight. Conversely, compassion facilitates spiritual progress. This understanding of violence as roadblock is most clearly displayed with the Ox King. When the group first meets the Ox King, Goku tries to beat him up in order to clear the pathway up Fire Mountain and take his Dragon Ball. The enormous man barely feels Goku's attacks. For the duration of this fight, everyone involved is stuck in an unproductive, pointless cycle that gets the pilgrims nowhere. It is only when Goku and the Ox King begin to understand each other's needs through conversation that the team gets any closer to their goal. We're collecting these, and I think you have one. Hey, I think I've seen one in my castle. Yes, of course you can have it, my new little friend. Compassion and understanding, rather than violence, lead to the trade that eventually nets the team another Dragon Ball. Which is all well and good when you're dealing with a scary but ultimately harmless threat like the Ox King. But how should our heroes approach a threat that can't be reasoned with? According to writer Paul R. Fleischmann, the Buddhist approach to nonviolence makes room for this kind of scenario. As he says, permitting someone else to perpetrate harm without consequences is not nonviolence. Defending innocent lives with violent means is hardly ideal, but it's preferable to rigid pacifism. In the last few episodes of the Emperor Pilaf saga, the team is confronted with an existential threat when Goku turns into a giant ape at the side of the full moon and threatens to eat Bulma. So Yamcha, Puar, and Oolong cut off Goku's tail to save Bulma and stop Goku from doing something he'd later regret. Their limited use of violence prevents worse violence down the road. This way, at least, nobody dies. This more nuanced understanding of violence would pop up in Toriyama's later work as well. Listen to Goku's description of himself in response to Frieza's question, What are you? I am the hope of the universe. I am the answer to all living things that cry out for peace. I am protector of the innocent. I am the light in the darkness. I am truth. Ally to good! Nightmare to you! Unlike the various villains that maim and murder throughout the series, Goku commits violent acts to preserve peace. Perhaps most interesting is how Dragon Ball handles the Buddhist concept of emptiness. The idea that things in themselves have no inherent or fixed essence. Early on, Toriyama asks us to consider this concept in relation to the Dragon Balls. Yeah, these gems have the power to do great things and not so great. From the start, the series points out that the Dragon Balls are neither inherently good, bad, or anything in between. They are simply a store of potential energy used to fulfill wishes. Even so, the heroes revere them as a life-changing miracle. Their disposition toward the Dragon Balls mirrors the pilgrim's attitude toward the sacred scrolls in Journey to the West. When the Buddha's assistants actually give them scrolls that are blank, they are more than a little pissed off, but they shouldn't be. Scholar Andrew Hui argues that the blankness of the scrolls is a material manifestation of the Buddhist doctrine of emptiness, a sign pointing to the nature of ultimate reality. The Buddha himself explains to the pilgrims that, as a matter of fact, it is such blank scrolls as these that are the true scriptures. By undercutting their expectations, the Buddha provides the pilgrims with a profound lesson about the nature of reality namely that it's empty of any inherent essence. In this way, the prank actually advances their spiritual progress. A similar bait and switch occurs in Dragon Ball. Remember Oolong's panty wish? By ruining Pilaf's wish, Oolong undercuts the hero's expectations, turning something as momentous as the summoning of the eternal dragon into a joke. While the Dragon Balls may have provided Oolong with a pair of panties, they haven't changed anyone's life in any meaningful way. Which is not to say the journey was for nothing. Far from it. In both the show and the novel, the revelation of the quest's inherent emptiness serves as a catalyst for growth beyond what the characters expected. In the final chapters of Journey to the West, the pilgrims are made into high-ranking members of the Buddha's paradise, while the heroes of Dragon Ball gain insight into the true scope of their various problems, which turn out to be not as terrible or permanent as they thought. Bulma and Yamcha plan to use the Dragon Balls to find a boyfriend and cure social anxiety, respectively, but after Oolong pulls his stunt, they realize the solution to their mutual problem has been in front of them the whole time. 
They agree to get together on the spot. Bulma lets go of her need for perfection, and Yamcha lets go of his fear. Even Oolong, who we first meet kidnapping young girls to staff his would-be harem, has learned to find happiness in thinking about others besides himself. When asked whether he will accompany Yamcha and Bulma to the city, he says, Oh, well, I guess I'll go. You guys need me. So, turtles, flashing, panties, and more. All in all, a pretty weird way of getting a religious message across, but that's kind of the point. Mahayana Buddhism, with its emphasis on teaching and collective enlightenment, is big into the concept of skillful means, or the guiding of sentient beings toward enlightenment according to their current abilities. In other words, meeting people where they're at. One way to meet people where they're at is to dispense with the dry lecturing and tell them a damn good story. And this is exactly what Dragon Ball and Journey to the West do. With engaging plot lines, creative characters, and writing that is alternatively tense and hilarious, Dragon Ball successfully weaves Buddhist morals into a story that people love to come back to again and again. And it's badass. Thanks for watching, Wisecrack. If you can't get enough Dragon Ball, there's plenty more where that came from if you check out Verve. That's VRV. It's made by our friends over at Crunchyroll, and they want to give Wisecrack fans seven days of free, sweet, HD ad-free viewing. Verve is a mega service, which means after you get your fill of Dragon Ball Super on Funimation, you can hop over to Crunchyroll for some Attack on Titan, then drop by Verve Select for some Harmon Quest without ever leaving the site. And now the value of the combo pack has gotten even better, with new channels included like Shudder, where you can scratch that horror itch, or Alpha for all your gaming needs, and it's still only $9.99 a month. So head over to verve.co slash wisecrack or click the link in the description for your free seven day verve combo pack you can get it on your desktop on their mobile app roku playstation and xbox thanks to verve for sponsoring this video and we've got tons more great stuff on the way including videos on captain america civil war django unchained and south park season 20 so be sure to head over to our channel page hit that subscribe button and ring that bell thanks again for watching all your support we couldn't do it without you guys peace